Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Daniel Brissett from the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Grace. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on the show. So tell us about how you got involved in environmental work. Oh, well, that goes back a little ways. Um, I uh, originally moved to Washington in uh, after college in 2001. I worked for a senator from Vermont. I'm from Vermont. Um, and at the time, he was, uh, his name is Jim Jeffords, and he uh, retired in 2006 uh, and has since passed away, uh, which is uh, really too bad because he was a really great guy and a great public servant. Um, he was notable because in May 2001, he defected from the Republican Party and joined the Democrats uh, or began caucusing with the Democrats. He was an independent. And part of that came with his uh, with new leadership on the Environment Public Works Committee. Uh, and so within a few short weeks uh, of my arrival on Capitol Hill to be his deputy press secretary, I was staffing Environment Committee things. And uh, that is kind of where I learned sort of the first uh, of the, all of the stuff I've learned about some of these topics. And I've always kind of had an interest in it. Um, I did some time in the state energy office in Maryland, learning about energy policy and energy efficiency in particular. And I returned to DC uh, to work in uh, the advocacy space around energy efficiency. Uh, and ESI is an organization that's been around for a long time. Uh, and when I had an opportunity to join it, I jumped at the chance uh, because we do a great combination of policy work, but also education work. And I'm endlessly fascinated by Capitol Hill and a lot of our work happens there. And, and so this is a, a really great place for me to express my interest in climate policy, but also express my interest in Article One and the first branch of government and, and all of that that goes along with Congress. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, what do you guys do? How did you guys get started? Well, we are celebrating 40 years in 2024. Um, we were originally created in the early 80s as a nonprofit to uh, provide educational materials, educational resources to members of Congress and their staff, originally about environmental and energy topics. And then later in the 80s, it became uh, more focused on climate change, which is kind of everything. So um, it kind of works. Um, our origins actually go back a little further into the, into the 70s. Um, there was originally a, a conference uh, that was started, but we were spun off as a 501c3 uh, in the early 80s. And our work involves a few different things. Uh, we're probably best known for our congressional briefings. So we do uh, in-person and virtual convenings of panelists, of experts and leaders uh, around the climate space, including business leaders uh, who come to Capitol Hill and provide um, our congressional audience with science-based nonpartisan information about these topics. Um, we do a lot of um, writing. We do a lot of articles. We do a lot of fact sheets. There's a photo of my team. Uh, we took a Friday afternoon off uh, back in December and visited the Anacostia uh, Community Museum and the Women in Environmental Justice uh, exhibit, uh, which uh, is a great thing if you haven't checked it out. Um, I think it's actually over now, but it's probably archived. We try to do team building things from time to time and that was a great, um, and of course, we had a happy hour afterwards. And there's the team again, we standing on a roof deck overlooking the White House uh, on a pretty nice fall day. Um, so we do a lot of writing. Uh, we do a lot of, of um, fact sheets and issue briefs and podcasts and things like that. But it's always designed to help congressional staff get up to speed quickly on climate topics. Um, over the last decade or so, we've also gained some experience working in rural areas with uh, cooperatives, electric cooperatives and other rural utilities. Uh, and we've uh, developed a program to help them access federal resources to set up uh, inclusive financing programs. I mentioned that because it's a part of what we do, but also one of the programs we've worked most closely with is the Hawaii Green Energy Money Savers or Hawaii GEMS program um, that is a, a, a cooperation, a collaboration between the Hawaii Green Bank uh, and HECO. So we actually know uh, or think we know Hawaii, at least in the on-bill financing space, fairly well. It's a program that we always take time to highlight because it is one of the most innovative of these on-bill financing programs uh, in the country. And the Hawaii Green Bank was the first of its kind uh, entity in the country to receive a federal rural energy savings program loan. So uh, trend setting uh, out there in Hawaii. Haven't actually been on a field visit. It's been a while since I've been to Hawaii. <laughs> I'll have to figure that out one of these days. So I am not familiar with the Hawaii Green Bank. 
I, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, it is a um, it's a, a sort of a standalone entity um, that the state set up a few years ago now to help leverage private capital. So the green bank model, every green bank is a little different. My little joke is they're neither green nor banks, um, <laughs> but they all kind of have their own model. Um, Hawaii has one. Connecticut has one. New York has one. Maryland has one. Um, they're all over the place and they're going to become a lot more common actually. Uh, following now that the Inflation Reduction Act has been enacted, there's a program called the or initiative called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that will encourage a lot of these types of entities to be set up. Um, but generally, what they do is they uh, they dedicate uh, scarce public resources to innovative financing and they attract capital from other sources. So the program that we've worked with with Gems uh, in Hawaii is actually a solar program. Um, and if you visit our website, you can read a case study about it um, and uh, learn all about the really, really innovative work that they've done to um, to bring uh, really cool financing to solve problems like energy affordability and clean energy access and, and things like that. Wonderful. I mean, this might be a good chance to go to the website, Michael, if you want to scroll through the website and you can show us where that is on the website. Yeah. So if you hover over, uh, well, actually, probably the uh, Easiest thing to do would be to, uh, in the search bar, just search for Hawaii Green Bank. I haven't tested that, but I assume it comes oh, right God. up. But if you go to the initiatives tab uh, along the top there, uh, you'll see something called on-bill financing. Uh, and if you clicked on that, uh, you would find your way to our main page and eventually to the, um, probably at the bottom of the case studies page, the, the GEMS case study. Yeah, all of our stuff is free, all online. Um, so not just a congressional audience can use it, but ordinary people, professors, um, you know, activists, uh, all sorts of people from all walks, uh, use our resources. And we're re really, really proud of that. That's wonderful. So, uh, can I ask you, it says on your website that you advance science-based solutions for climate change, energy, and environmental challenges. How do you guys do that? We do it in a couple different ways. Um, I mean, for our policy work that's based in Washington, it really does all revolve around Congress. Um, and so those briefings that we put on, we do about two dozen of them a year. Um, and we try to cover as many uh, topics as possible. So what we try to do is bring these experts to Capitol Hill. That's a photo of a briefing we did last June, I think it was, on green hydrogen uh, with our friends at the Environmental Defense Fund. And so um, you know, all of those people or most of those people in the audience are congressional staff who are interested in green hydrogen. Um, and we pulled together a panel that included EDF and Clean Air Task Force and Natural Resources Defense Council uh, who could sort of talk about their uh, work uh, on green hydrogen, uh, especially around uh, issues that would ensure that hydrogen is, uh, is actually a climate solution and is not contributing to the problem um, by um, emitting um, or risk emitting uh, additional greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from combusting fossil fuels. So um, th so that's largely how we go about doing our work, certainly the highest profile way we do our work. But we also do a lot of writing. We do a lot of fact sheets. When you're a congressional staff person, um, it's a great – Capitol Hill is a great place to be if you're curious um, because it is just an overload of information. Uh, and literally you snap your fingers and you have 10 groups, 10, 10 people who just can't wait to give you – everything you need to know on the topic. However, a lot of those groups are interest groups, which is fine, special interests. Everyone uh, has a right to be there for sure. ESI isn't a special interest. And so when a congressional staff person turns to ESI, we're able to provide them information that hasn't been filtered by an industry trade group or a special interest. And so that gives us a lot of credibility on, on Capitol Hill. We might have someone from a clean energy group or an energy efficiency group or another sector ac across the, you know, the climate space participate in a briefing, but they're participating in our briefing. Uh, and so it's really important that we kind of lend that third party uh, credibility. Um, it's also really important that we give these staff people the information they need before they even know they need it. So we're all, we can't predict what Congress is going to do, but we can figure out if we think hard enough what they'll be working on at any given moment. And so we typically try to time our briefings so that when uh, you know February or March rolls around, for example, that's the beginning of the appropriation cycle. So that's when we'll be doing briefings on process and things like that. At the beginning of a Congress, which is every two-year period following an election, 
Um, we're in the 118th Congress right now, second session. But last year at this time, we were in the middle of Congressional Climate Camp, so trying to put together a series of briefings that really kind of covered the basics um, of climate policy. Um, we work with the members, we work with the staff, we work with our other groups, but that's largely how we try to go about our work. So this is kind of an apropos moment to talk about uh, fossil fuels. You know, since we talked a little bit about hydrogen fuel, how do you think we can decrease our dependency on fossil fuels in general as a nation? Well, uh, there's all sorts of ways we can do it. Um, the U.S. has actually been in an energy transition now for some time. Um, you know, the energy economy or the energy sector looked very different 20 years ago. Uh, it looks very different today. Um, part of that is because, uh, and we've covered this in our briefings, part of that is because uh, we use less coal to generate electricity. We use relatively more natural gas. We also use a lot more renewable energy to generate electricity. And so we're always kind of in this state of flux. Um, fossil fuels, uh, when you combust them, they release um, carbon dioxide and other pollutants, other emissions into the atmosphere. They build up. Uh, and even though they take up a relatively small part of the atmosphere, uh, the fact that we're adding them uh, at uh, basically an unabated rate uh, has really consequences for kind of the global system for the climate, right? Because we're really talking about Earth and then a couple miles above Earth. And so um, the, what we've been emitting over a lot of time, uh, you know, basically since the industrial period, um, has really started to up. And it's really, really important for us to, uh, to, to move away from consuming fossil fuels uh, and to find alternatives. Uh, one way we can do that is by electrifying. Um, and um, part of that electrification only works if the electricity is carbon free. So there are things like burning gasoline in your cars to fuel it. You can move to an electric vehicle, but then there's also just electrifying things generally. For example, um, maybe this isn't as big of a thing in Hawaii, but right now it's pretty cold in Washington, uh, and a lot of people have gas furnaces. Gas, I have a gas furnace in, in our house. Eventually, we'll transition away from it. Um, but you know, moving in, uh, moving away from fossil fuel consumption, uh, sort of on site, uh, whether it's a solar installation like this um, that can help offset um, energy from the grid, especially when that grid is dirty, um, or it, you know, the electricity is coming from fossil fuels. That's that's one alternative uh, electrifying end uses, like moving away from furnaces to things like heat pumps um, and other electric technologies is another. Um, but this is really a, an economy-wide challenge. Um, if you think about how dependent we are on fossil fuels, not just for our energy, but also for plastics and for other, um, you know, for other products, um, it is a massive challenge. And Unfortunately, we have to be moving much, much faster than we currently are moving. Um, and so we're doing what we try to do is we try to highlight solutions of where this is actually happening and working um, to help illustrate how it's possible at scale, at scope, and at a rapid enough pace that allow us to avoid the worst outcomes of climate change. Yeah, I mean, I know one of the alternatives is wind, like they have these windmills, um, wind power. So can you talk about the pros and cons of the wind power? Because we had a big area kind of on the North Shore where they were thinking about doing that, but there was a lot of opposition. I don't know exactly what's going on with that now, but um, what are the pros and cons of something like wind power? Well, I won't pretend to understand the dynamics on the North Shore at all. Um, a lot of a lot of these installations are, um, you know, they're they're talked about. Some of them are controversial at the local level, and and that's fine. But, um, and it's important for people to sort this stuff out because, um, you know, these are, you know, significant investments that will be there for a long time, and we also have to make sure that uh, communities that are impacted have a seat at the table from the very beginning um, as these deployment decisions are being made. So, um, wind power uh, has a lot going for it. There are wind uh, installations offshore and onshore. Um, there aren't that many uh, on, or excuse me. There aren't that many offshore currently in the United States. Most wind is deployed on land, uh, and uh, and you see them. They're often hundreds of feet tall. They have enormous blades that spin. Um, the pros is that that they're generating carbon free electricity, um, and they're doing so um, in a way that is fairly deployable. You can you know you can have uh, you know a, you know a, a wind installation you know fairly close to, uh, you know, where that energy 
needs to be consumed. Unfortunately, where wind resources are, are not always where population centers. And so where you see a lot of wind energy, you see a lot of wind energy in the Midwest, you see a lot of wind energy in Texas, uh, through Oklahoma, all those places. Um, while there are certainly population centers in those states, most of the population centers are not next door to those wind turbines. And so you have to think very carefully about where you're, where you're developing them and then how you're going to move the electricity from where it's, where it's produced to where it's actually going to be consumed. And right now in Washington, that's a huge debate, transmission and permitting challenges to get the energy from where it's actually you know, being made to, to where it's needed. Um, another, I'm not going to say downside because um, it's pretty much better than the alternatives, but um, you know, wind is an intermittent resource. The wind isn't always blowing, um, and those big wind turbines obviously require a fair amount of wind to um, to move the blades. Um, it's kind of funny that wind and solar uh, often are sort of talked about having um, sort of, you know, uh, the resource is stronger for solar during the day for obvious reasons. Wind resources are actually stronger at night for less obvious reasons, but there's typically more wind at night. And so uh, we've actually done briefings where you can see um, uh, there are models that are out there that you can actually see the continental United States. And you can see where the sun is rising and where the sun is moving over the landscape and where solar resources are popping on. And then when the sun goes down, you can see the wind resources start to pick up. Um, and so they're complementary resources. Um, but um, you know, there, are, uh, there are some people in, in this area that feel that wind uh, interferes with military training. There's a big controversy in Maryland over wind turbines uh, and, and um, Pax River, which is a big military installation in Maryland. There's some people who are concerned about its effects uh, on, on birds and migratory birds. Um, there are people who are concerned about the sighting of, of wind, you know, offshore uh, and sort of what that does to the, the habitat on the seabed. Um, you know, these are, these are real issues, um, but um, those are issues that when, especially when you have a collaborative process, then you include people from the very beginning, sort of in the entire decision making. And as long as we're thinking about the goal of this is not to erect a wind turbine, it's to stop putting carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the atmosphere. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of optimism that we can get over um, some of these challenges and we can solve challenges uh, and we can kind of, what we like to say at ESI is transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. And you can't really have that without wind. So uh, just shifting gears a bit and going back, since it seems like we will be dependent on fossil fuels at least for a bit until we can completely transition. Why are, why are, you know, why is it so much cheaper to buy fuel in the United States than it is in Europe? Well, um, there are reasons for that. Um, we have a lot of resources here. The United States is a big country, it's geographically very diverse, and we have petroleum resources here um, that would power our country for many, many years uh, if we wanted it to. Um, there's, you know, we we obviously export petroleum, um, but uh, but that's uh, certainly a driver. Um, not all petroleum resources are liquid petroleum resources, um, and so you know there are, you know, the gasoline you put in your car, for example, or the diesel you put in your car is different than um what you um you know would would get out of a, out of the ground if you're you know extracting natural gas um another thing is that our economy is kind of set up around uh you know qu quick and easy transportation and often that comes in single passenger vehicles um and when that happens uh it is um sort of you can kind of you know take that to the end which is um, you know, gas is, is relatively inexpensive here because it's allowed to be relatively inexpensive here. Um, you know, it isn't heavily taxed uh, compared to where it is in Europe. Uh, and that means that there are fewer resources to, you know, spend on other priorities, especially uh, uh, climate priorities. Um, when you start manipulating gas prices with taxes or when you start, I mean, gas prices, when they go above $4 or $5 or whatever it is, it's always front page news. Well, that's because people need gasoline to get around. They need to get to work. Uh, and unfortunately, gas is one of those things. Gas prices are one of those things that tend to uh, impact families who can sort of least afford it um, the most. Um, you know, it's a, if, if it's a, a fixed expense in a family's budget, that's one thing. But if it's a variable expense and it goes way, way up and all of a sudden it takes 20 percent more resources to, you know, drive around and, and, and do all of that, especially in rural areas where there are fewer options for public transportation. It's something that people really feel. 
Uh, and there's some genuine affordability issues that policymakers have to think about as we move away so that the next alternative, the electric alternative, for example, um, is just as a, is, is more affordable and more accessible. Um, we like to say at ESI, we're talking about trading up, not trading off. Uh, and so how do we come up with uh, policies? How do we come up with investments that allow us to trade up uh, to um, alternative fuel vehicles, uh, especially electric vehicles? Uh, and actually, that's a photo of a tax incentive briefing we did last September. Uh, the gentleman there in the blue tie, uh, that's uh, uh, he, Chris, he works for Growth Energy, which is the uh, biofuels trade group. Uh, and so, you know, there are all, all additional alternative fuels um, that are out there, especially uh, when it comes to like aviation. Uh, and sustainable aviation fuel and things like that. So isn't there some kind of fossil fuel subsidy? Can you tell us about that? <laughs> there are billions of dollars of fossil fuel subsidies. We actually have a fact sheet um, that we'll be sending out uh, very shortly. Uh, it's an update to one that we've been working on for and, and had different updates over the last couple of years. Yes, there are subsidies. Some of those subsidies are direct. Um, some of them are um, you know, uh, indirect. So we would consider a subsidy um, you know, basically along the lines of uh, fossil fuel externalities. So, you know, when when a fossil fuel producer is not uh, absorbing the cost of the consumption uh, and all of the harms that fossil fuel consumption causes, uh, we would consider that an externality. Um, if, if, if we had our way, uh, we wouldn't fossil uh, subsidize fossil fuels. We would be using those billions of dollars of resources for other things like deploying clean energy, like helping people uh, make their homes more energy efficient um, by helping them install solar panels on their roofs, uh, you know, to really help address uh, energy affordability and accessibility issues. Um, you know, it, I haven't heard of a super compelling case for keeping fossil fuel subsidies other than fossil fuel subsidies make fossil fuel production more profitable. Um, and once uh, you have something, it's very difficult to take it away. Um, but uh, there are um, well more than a dozen uh, proposals in last year's federal budget proposal uh, from the Biden-Harris administration to repeal um, those subsidies. There, are, um, there are, There's legislation that's been introduced over the last several years that would do that. Um, and we also have to think about uh, our subsidization of fossil fuels in the context of international climate agreements like the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, how on earth can we possibly stand a chance to um, – reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50% by 2030 if we're also subsidizing fossil fuels uh, and we're also making the problem um, incrementally worse. So, uh, yeah, we have a lot of problems with fossil fuel subsidies at ESI. It's not a good use of resources, uh, and it's making the problem a little worse and actually quite a bit worse. Uh, and it would be really, really nice if we could use those resources for other things that help the problem. Yeah, I mean, if you ever noticed in Europe, their cars are super are super tiny. It's hard to fit an American car in there. Spot, <laughs> honestly, the average size, especially here in Hawaii, it seems like everyone has a truck. So you go somewhere and you have a normal four-door sedan, and your car is the smallest on the lot. You know, and, and um, all these big trucks are parking next to you. You know, so um, I feel like if there were some kind of way to eliminate these subsidies, maybe people would choose more wisely what kind of car they get and only get a truck if they really needed it you know? so i mean i don't know if if any of these things will pass but i surely hope if people have more awareness about it that you know maybe eventually we can eliminate these subsidies yep. um, so i wanted to ask you about your allies on capitol hill who are your allies is it along party lines do you find that there's people in both parties that are interested in the environment. How is how is that working out? Um, we do our best to get along with everyone, um, and we try very hard to um, cultivate allies um, and uh, on both sides of the aisle in both chambers. Um, it's really important for us to um, you know have those relationships so that when um, uh, when we you know. It gives us credibility, but it also, you know, there are a lot of climate solutions out there. Many of them are bipartisan. And so we want to find examples of where people can work together. The Inf uh, Inflation Reduction Act was not 
a bipartisan bill, but the infrastructure bill was. Uh, and there was a lot of really good stuff that was included in that bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, and it was something that we really welcomed at the time. Um, and so we try really hard to cultivate allies um, um, of, of all sorts. Um, sometimes that's the members themselves, sometimes that's the senators or representatives, but oftentimes it's the staff. And so that's a photo of Representative Jim Clyburn. Uh, he's one of our, our top allies, one of our best friends on the Hill. He uh, is responsible for the Rural Energy Savings Program, uh, which helps rural utilities um, provide on inclusive on-bill financing programs for their customers. That was our big energy efficiency expo that happens every summer. Uh, he was a speaker uh, at the one that we held last July. Um, so we try really hard to make friends wherever we can on, on pretty much whatever issue we can. Um, we also try really hard to play really well with the other people in the sandbox. So Capitol Hill is an ecosystem. The members are part of it, the staff are part of it, but so are all of the different groups that uh, are engaged on Capitol Hill. And so we try really hard to work with organizations of all political affiliations um, from across the entire energy space, you know, that uh, photo of the briefing you showed a little earlier, I, I pointed out Chris, uh, he works uh, on on biofuels with growth energy, but, uh, you know, he was seated next to someone who works on hydrogen. He was seated next to someone who works on nuclear. And we had nine panelists, um, U.S. Green Building Council, U.S. Conference of Mayors. We had nine panelists talking about all of the different uh, tax incentives that were enacted as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And part of the reason why we had nine panelists, which is like more than twice we normally would have, is to give the idea, to communicate visually the idea that the climate sector is really big and broad and that there are places for everyone to bring their solutions to the table to help us reduce emissions. Uh, and so we try to we try to make friends wherever we can. It's a big part of what we do. It's actually a core strategy uh, of what we of everything that we try to do at ESI. So what would you say has been the biggest contributor to climate change? Uh, well, it's it's not close. It's um, burning fossil fuels, um, and then the uh, emissions find their way into the atmosphere. Um, but we've spent a lot of time thinking about um, sort of other causes as well. And one I was thinking about um, before we we started the, the our chat today um, is the loss of biodiversity. Um, and we've been covering nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions, um, partially because of the amount of interest that's being paid to the farm bill right now, which is still sort of being developed. But, um, you know, when you pair, um, you know, uh, lots and lots of carbon dioxide and lots and lots of methane, uh, being emitted into the atmosphere from, uh, from fossil fuels. And when you pair that with unsustainable conservation practices and a lack of biodiversity, um, you know, we're really we're really harming um, sort of the entire the entire ecosystem of the planet, um, and uh, and that is something that you know individually those would be really bad things, but when they're taken together, they're even worse. Uh, and so it's really important for us to be thinking not just about fossil fuels and not just about emissions, but also uh, sort of the impact that uh, we're having on nature, and also the impact that we're having on community on our, our own communities. Um, you know. It's easy, I think, to kind of focus, maybe overfocus a bit on mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. But even if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, which there's a pretty low chance of that happening, there is enough CO2 and enough methane in the atmosphere that we will have climate change. We'll have global warming for decades. It's built up. Uh, and so we have to also be thinking about resilience. We have to be thinking about adaptation. Uh, we have to be thinking, and a lot of those, uh, there's a lot of overlap with resilience and adaptation and those natural climate solutions. We actually did a briefing a couple of years ago on coastal resilience in Hawaii and featured the Hawaii Green Bank uh, and featured some of the resilience work that's being done uh, in Hawaii. That's a photo of some of the installations that the GEMS uh, program has made possible. Um, but uh, it's really important that we're focusing on, on sort of the whole picture because it is a, a truly holistic issue. Uh, climate climate change is a, is a really holistic threat, um, and everything that we can do, pretty much anything we can do, uh, will help us get to uh, where we need to be and uh, avoid the worst outcomes. So we, we we try to think pretty broadly and not just about fossil fuels. So just uh, because we're out of time, um, do you have a takeaway as to what an individual can do themselves at home to slow down climate change? and also what our country can do to slow down climate change. Sure, well, I think you know, on the individual level, the more that people are concerned, I think that's one thing that, that people ask themselves a lot, you know, what can I do? Um, 
there are certainly things uh, that we can do individually. Um, and, you know, some of them are, you know, uh, you know, selecting, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, um, what's it called? Digital, digital is not the right word. Um, paperless billing, you know, things like that. My credit card companies are always trying to get me to do paperless billing, things like that. But I think a lot of the discourse around climate solutions actually puts a lot on the individual. And I think when you actually think about what one individual's ability to change things is, yes, there's absolutely things that we can all individually do. But, you know, I don't have a lot of say in terms of like what stuff I buy comes in in terms of packaging. Um, I was talking to a reporter once about sustainable aviation. And the reporter asked, like, well, what can you do? And I'm like, nothing. I, I'm a passenger. Like, literally, I'm the la I walk on a plane. I don't have a whole lot of say in terms of how that plane is going to be flown or uh, how that plane is going to be handled on the ground uh, or any of the operations that go into, you know, moving passengers and freight and cargo and all of that, you know, through the air. Like, I can make certain choices in terms of how I, how I travel. But, you know, ultimately, I don't have a lot of say in terms of how green or how not green the aviation industry is. And I think that actually extends to a lot of other things. I think about packaging a lot. You know, why why is it my responsibility to take care of the packaging? Why why aren't companies uh, that make the products that go into the packaging, uh, you know, required to be more accountable for what goes into that packaging and its effect on the environment? Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of what we can do as a country, um, obviously moving towards decarbonized clean energy as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we have a lot of great work happening right now in, in all parts of the country, uh, you know, with deploying renewable energy, but there could be so much more uh, when you look at the actual percentages of renewable energy, there's still so much room to grow. You look at electric vehicle adoption, there's so much room to go. Um, but, uh, and, and then you look at, um, you know, other things like um, think about our buildings and how inefficient most of these buildings are and how important buildings are to everything we do. Um, you know, I'm in a building, you're in a building. We spend a lot of time in our buildings uh, and the building sector is a, a major contributor to, to emissions. And it's also a connecting sort of node for the transportation sector uh, and the power sector. It's where a lot of things come together. Um, so I think there's certainly a lot of things that we could do there. We've already talked about ending fossil fuel subsidies. That would be really, really high on my, my wish list. But one thing that we really absolutely have to do um, is we have to be very mindful that as we transition away from fossil fuels, as we transition to a decarbonized energy economy, um, there the that transition will have different impacts on different communities. And it will have different impacts on different people. Um, and most of, some of those will be positive. Some of those will not be positive. And for people who are negatively affected by that transition, we have to, as I think, as a as a society, as a as a country, we have to be really focused on uh, sort of taking care of them and being compassionate as we move through the transition, um, because there will be people who are currently dependent and communities that are currently dependent on fossil fuel production. If that stops being a thing, what's going to happen to them? Um, we have to be really mindful. Um, there are also people who have been really, really badly harmed um, by. Um, environmental degradation and climate change over the years. We also need to keep in mind how we can do a lot better by them. And a lot of that includes uh, including them in decision-making from the beginning, uh, ensuring that we're not just telling communities how they, should, how they should behave, but we're talking with them about how they want to behave and what kind of opportunities they want. Um, there's a lot of sort of human challenges to this transition. And I, I would really like us to be mindful um, of how we deal with that. Because a lot of these things are choices, and we have the ability to make optimal choices or suboptimal choices. And especially as we're dealing with communities and individuals impacted, um, I think it's really worth taking the time and really devoting the resources to um, helping them manage this transition so that we all come out of it better, um, so that our a decarbonized clean energy future is a better future. I think it's possible, but it's not going to happen automatically. It's going to have to be something that's deliberate and that's, um, that's done with purpose. Well, thank you so much. We're out of time, so we have to wrap it up. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on Think Tech Hawaii. We've been talking with Daniel Brissett, president of the Environmental Energy Institute, about climate change and environmental challenges. Thanks for being here. If you enjoyed this coverage and conversation, please hit the like button.
below and subscribe to our channel, youtube.com slash ThinkTechHawaii, for more great content on ThinkTech. To sign up for our email advisories and get a complete listing of all our shows, to make a donation and keep us going, visit our website, ThinkTechHawaii.com. We'll be back in two weeks, so please tune in and tell your friends to tune in then. Check out my website at gracehawaii.com or Instagram at gracehawaii365 for more information about my show guests. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha. Thank you.